بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأراضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف We continue our study of chapter 2 of the first section of Mafatih al-Hayat by Ayatullah Jawadi Amali Hafizahullah. This chapter is about knowledge. And as you remember, yesterday we said about different types of knowledge that everyone should be equipped with. Learning beautiful teachings of Ahlul Bayt salam, their sciences, in particular, we also refer to issues related to halal and haram, to sharia. And those who do a kind of business or trade or a profession in general, they should be very well aware of those issues that pertain to their job. So these are the things that we discussed yesterday. Another thing is to learn skills and to be trained for doing something productive. So it's not just good you learn some theories and you are not able to undertake any job, any you know, task. You should be able to undertake some professions. For example, Amir al Mu'mini salam says, Al Hirfatu ma al Iffah Khayrun min al Ghana ma al Fujur. To have a job with modesty is better to be than being rich but sinful. So it's good to have a job. But of course, Ayatollah Jawadi says this means that we have to also train ourselves for different jobs and different tasks. In addition to skills for jobs, there is also recommendation to learn some skills that you may consider them as not jobs. You may say these are hobbies, or you may say these are skills that might be useful for the society. For example, we have this hadith that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allimu awladakum as sabaha. Teach your children swimming. Yes, some people maybe this becomes their job, but I don't think Rasulullah meant to become, you know, professional necessarily. It means that this is something that can help you at some time. And it's amazing that Rasulullah in the middle of <laughs> desert <laughs> says, if, if people live near the sea or ocean, definitely they must. But even Rasulullah says, maybe one day you'll realize that you have to use this. It can be a way to save yourself. It can be a way to save some people, if you are in a boat or you see someone is sinking, or maybe even when there is a defense of your country, or you need to be equipped. Another thing is, <laughs> Teach them how to shoot arrows. Of course, it can still, you know, it's a kind of a sport to shoot arrow, but it doesn't need to be always arrow. <laughs> means teach them how to be able to use uh, means of defense and means of support. So these are among things that we can mention as skills. But these are not only this. Maybe in this age, for example, it's very important that you teach them how to drive, for example. Because today, if someone cannot drive, it's a problem. Maybe it's important to teach them at proper age how to use computer because if someone today cannot you know use computer then has lots of limitations but in the right time of course 
Another thing is there is recommendation of teaching your children and learning yourself, of course, because you cannot teach unless you know yourself, uh, poems, literature, you can say. Of course, not every poem. You know, Quran is critical of those who used poem as a vehicle to just say their imaginations and, you know, sometimes even deceive people. No. Poem is a very important vehicle for conveying deep spiritual, theological, philosophical, social, ethical meanings. Like, you know, for example, if there is an ambulance and you use it, you know, to take, you know, bricks from this point to another point, it's a misuse of ambulance. <laughs> yeah? You have to use every vehicle for the best thing that it can use, it can be used for. Poem should be used for wise ideas, a spiritual idea, something that would have impact on the heart, not for singing, you know, bad things or, you know, just romantic poem or so on and so forth. For example, كان أمير المؤمنين يعجبه أن يروى شعر أبي طالب. أمير المؤمنين was happy to see that people read and recite poems by Abu Talib عليه السلام. وأن يدون and to be compiled. Because Hazrat Abu Talib was a very faithful person, a man of virtue, but also he had ability to compose poem and express wise ideas. So Amir al mumini was very happy that people read poems by Abu Talib, because some people used to have poems of Jahiliya. But poems of Abu Talib were different. وَقَالَ تَعَلَّمُوهُ وَعَلَّمُوهُ أَوْلَادَكُمْ Amir al Mumni said, you should learn poems of Abu Talib and teach your children. Why? فَإِنَّهُ كَانَ عَلَى دِينَ اللَّهِ وَفِيهِ عِلْمٌ كَثِيرٌ Because Hazrat Abu Talib was a man who was on the path of God, and in his poem, there is abundant knowledge. Ilmun Kathir. This is in Vasa'il Shia and also in uh, other books. So, to teach poem, but also, for example, we have uh, about, for example, poem of another person also. So, we can say this is not only one poem and one poet, this is a great example, but there can be also other examples. Now we enter manners of learning and teaching. Uh, this may take another day. I mentioned some of it so that tomorrow we can finish. One is to learn from people who are qualified. You don't take your food from every hand because it can poison you. Knowledge is not less important than food. Indeed, the good thing about being poisoned by food is that quickly <laughs> you see there is a problem. But the problem with poisoning of ideas and thought is that you enjoy them and you just need more poison. <laughs> it's like a person who is addicted. It's not that he starts, you know, vomiting or, you know, having fever. No, actually, if he stops, he feels uncomfortable. Maybe he has headache if he doesn't take the drug. So, poisoning of 
thoughts can be very dangerous because very gentle, very subtle, and you don't notice, and actually you may start enjoying. So, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we have many things, but I only mention some of the things that are mentioned here. Talabu al-ilm faridatun ala kull muslim. Seeking knowledge is obligatory for every Muslim. There is no exception. Seeking knowledge. We don't say you have to become alim. We don't say you have to become full-time, part-time talab. But as much as you can, you must seek knowledge. Maybe for one person, seeking knowledge is few hours every day. Maybe for someone is few hours per week. But at least, I think, one hour per day, every person can do it and must do it. Less than one hour, I don't think is enough. At least you can be counted as a person who is seeking knowledge. Talabul ilm. Unfortunately, sometimes we don't seek knowledge, and even if knowledge is brought to us, we close our eyes and ears. When they see that, for example, there is a lecture on TV, they go to another channel. When they see lecture is masjid, they leave. When there is book, they leave it aside. So knowledge is coming to us and we don't welcome. But we have actually to go for knowledge up to China. You have to, even endanger your life, go to oceans, seeking knowledge. So, I think if you want to be very modest, at least every person has to study one hour per day so that he can say, I have listened to Rasulullah. I am talibul ilm. Rasulullah said, talibul ilm farida. In the whole planet, Sunni Shia, do you find one person who questions this hadith? I don't think you find one single Muslim who says, I doubt about this hadith. This is accepted by all Muslims. Okay, how we are going to answer to this? How we are going to say to Rasulullah, yes, we listen to this fariza. At least one hour every day. It's a minimum. Even that might not be enough, but... I say at least. Now, how? You say, okay, I want to seek knowledge. How? From where? Fatlubu al-ilm min madhanihi waqtabisuhu min ahlihi. Seek knowledge in its places which are prepared for that in its proper places. You cannot seek for knowledge on a TV channel, which is, for example, planned for other things, and just once <laughs> in a day, for example, they have a lecture. This is not a platform for knowledge. Or on a newspaper, for example. Or in a secular setting like secular universities. Okay, you go to secular universities, maybe to learn some techniques, some skills, even about Islamic studies, I don't say do it or not do it, but I'm saying you don't learn your religion from a secular college or university. Okay, you can get a degree. You don't get your religion from religious education class in a public school. You get your religious education from proper platforms, which are prepared for that, which have authenticity, which have originality and loyalty to the tradition. How can someone who doesn't believe teach my children religion? You know, in this country, a person who teaches religion can be an atheist. I was speaking with someone a few days ago. 
And he said he was doing a PGSE course, PGCE course, Postgraduate Certificate of Education. And he said most of people in their group were atheists and they want to teach religion. They say it's a kind of objective subject. As long as you teach it objectively, it's okay. But how can someone who has already decided against religion and decided against faith in God, how can he teach religion? It's not possible. So, when I say seeking religion, I am not saying seeking not, not, uh, religion in any platform, from every person. And you are happy that you have a certificate. No. That's on the side. From mavanhi, from places that are prepared and you are expected to get the right information and right attitude. وَاكْتَبِسُوهُ مِنْ أَهْلِهِ And take it from its people. People who are committed to it. I finish with one hadith. Rasulullah quotes from Zulqarnain. It seems Zulqarnain was such a, at least, pious or wise person that Rasulullah quotes from him and, you know, Allah Tabatabai has some idea about Zulqarnain. Anyway, Min wasiyyate Zulqarnain, Rasulullah says, from the things that he used to advise was this. La tata'allam al-ilma mimman lam yantafi' bih. Don't learn from someone who is not benefiting from his religion. Uh, sorry, from his knowledge. For example, he's teaching religion, but he doesn't believe in religion. Tells you how to look after your mental health, for example, but he himself has mental issues. Look after your diet, but he himself doesn't look at his diet. You cannot benefit him. Then Zulqarnain brings an argument. He says, فَإِنَّ مَنْ لَمْ يَنْفَعْهُ عِلْمُهُ لَا يَنْفَعْكَ If someone, his knowledge has not benefited him, would not benefit you. If he didn't believe and practice, it's almost, I'm not saying 100% impossible, it's almost impossible to have impact on you. You know, if I say to you something, and you know that I don't believe, I don't appreciate, it is just the way I want to get my salary. But it doesn't have impact on you. Or, if you know that, actually I am against this. Because many times these people who are atheists, it's very unlikely that they teach religion and they don't use it as a way to undermine. Because... <laughs> They use this as a way to pass on their doubts and criticism. Normally, this is expected. Okay, inshallah, we continue with the rest of the manners. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our generation a generation of Muslims for whom seeking knowledge, sharing knowledge, and implementing knowledge is their daily concern. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give long life to our ulama and teachers and maraja and strengthen our institutions for learning. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give shifa to all people who are ill. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give rahmah and maghfirah to all mu'mineen and mu'minat who have passed away, especially those who have rights upon us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to prepare us for Laylatul Qad, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen.